Hi everyone. I hope all of you are fine and doing good at your home and enjoying or maybe suffering whatever at this time. And uh, so welcome you all in our Corona Cures webinar series. And uh, I'm Vijay Soni from uh, Corona Cures and Cypreneur. So in today's time, most of you are must be having a lot of questions, especially uh, regarding the, uh, um, the diagnosis and the therapeutic intervention of the uh, coronavirus. And, and that is the reason why, uh, why we invited Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia from uh, IIT, Kanpur, IIT Gandhinagar. Sorry. And welcome, Dr. Dheeraj. Thank you. Um, so he is actually as a, um, is a assistant professor at uh, IIT Gandhinagar. And he is, uh, his laboratory is mainly working on DNA nanotechnology driven chemical biology and uh, uh, chemical and biological discoveries. And he's trying to merge the complex programmability of DNA nanotechnology with the structural and functional di diversity of other biomolecules. The, uh, other, uh, um, the overarching goal of his team is to translate uh, laboratory findings into new therapeutic strategy. So in today's session, he is going to talk about the role of DNA nanotechnology in COVID-19 therapeutics and diagnosis. And this will include an introduction of uh, DNA nanotechnology, the current landscape in healthcare sector, and its emerging role in COVID-19 diagnosis and vaccine development. So before we start, I would like to request all of our audience that uh, please, uh, send your questions and any queries or any doubt in the Zoom chat box, and we will try to address them at the end of the webinar. So I know I, now I would like to request Dr. Dheeraj to start. Dr. Dheeraj. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Vijay. And uh, thank you all for joining on a Saturday morning, uh, I think, in USA. I'm sure most of you must be sitting uh, with a cup of coffee. So, yeah, in the same I do have the last coffee of the day uh, while speaking with you all from this part of the world. It's a great pleasure to connect with the, the, the colleagues in USA. And, uh, always a great pleasure to be with the partners with a very high diversity in scientific interests and uh, um, the quest to know more and more. So I'll try to present my two cents on what this new field, the DNA nanotechnology is trying to do uh, with respect to the ongoing pandemics. Like we all know, uh, the biggest quest or the biggest um, solution at this moment is a hunt for a proper vaccine and the cheap diagnostic tools, which can be affordable even by the poor countries or the common uh, people all over the world. And I'll show you what some of the efforts in this field are ongoing. Um, um, I'll try to add a slide or two of um, the work which we are doing here at IIT Gandhinagar, but most of the work which I'm presenting you has been taken from the established laboratories uh, uh, in USA and Europe, and I have tried to acknowledge them, and I'll try to present to you a view where this field is moving and what we are doing with regard to the COVID-19. So uh, let me begin with a small uh, introduction to the biology, or like what we know is that everything in nature self-assembles like you can take any system the atom which is made of the nucleus with protons and neutrons and electrons right so the molecules the biomolecules like the protein dna lipids sugar cells tissues living organisms like us every all the systems in the nature the self-assemble and when we look at even the viruses like the coronavirus the very interesting structure which it adopts and the most interesting example which entail the biological macromolecules are two broad classes like the nucleic acids and the proteins and why we see bulk of the macromolecules in the nature are made from these two principal components uh, the nucleic acids and the proteins it's because their surfaces encode information like let's take a simple example that even the the spike protein which is present on the coronavirus surface like it has information that it can recognize the receptor on the host cell it can bind and then it can put its RNA into the cell and then infect the host cells, right? So these are the two main components that the proteins and the nucleic acids, which have been largely explored in the biology and now in the technology because of their ability to encode information. If we see simple 
uh, proteins, like the molecules proteins, they are the long strings of the amino acids which can fold into 3D shapes like the tertiary structures. And most of these tertiary structures can self-assemble further into the quaternary structures. Uh, and these many, many proteins have different diverse functions in the biological systems, like even the, the, the viral coat protein here, which is a simple trimer which can self-assemble into the icosahedral geometry. And it gives a very, very unique shape to the viral structures. But the problem is that we don't know completely how to predict or modulate the structures of these proteins. Like we need a lot of computation, a lot of experimental uh, um, uh, procedures, which are really very complex. And not many, many labs in the world are at this moment doing. Like there is one example of professor in, um, uh, in, um, uh, in Washington, uh, who is trying to do de novo synthesis of the proteins, but there are very, very limited uh, examples of this kind of research where we engineer the structures of the proteins de novo using the computation and the experimental models. Be that's because of the diversity in the amino acids and the way they assemble and the structures of the resultant proteins. So it's really complex to play around with or do the engineering with the proteins. On the other hand, DNA, the genetic molecule of our life is much, much more simpler. Like if we see the double standard structure of the DNA, it's made from four molecules or four nucleic bases, the A, T, G, and C. And we all know that just four molecules and two simple rules that A forms Watson Creek base pairing with T and G forms Watson Creek base pairing with C. And based on this, the sequences in the DNA can very, very precisely self-assemble with each other. And this gives rise to the information which is encoded into the structure. Now, this is the genetic and the biological function of the DNA. It is encoding the genetic information and it is passing it on from generations to generations. But what I will present to you today is something totally non-biological functions of the DNA. Like if you look at this molecule, the DNA, from a chemist's perspective, like you look at it as from a chemist's eye, it will tell you that it is nothing but a simple polymer. It's a small polymer, which is made from these nodes or the nucleotides. And every polymer, we know that it has a persistence length, that it can act as a rigid rod up to the distances of 50 nanometers, which is its persistence length. And it has a very, very specific rule that the A can recognize specifically T and G can recognize C. So with these two rules, we started to play around with the DNA. And this field, the DNA nanotechnology, takes advantage of the these two properties of the DNA. So let's say this is a duplex DNA, where you have one piece of sequence, which is bound or uh, recognized by the complementary sequence. And you can assume this as a cylinder, a small cylinder, which is like this. And what we can do is I can extend one of the strands on the double standard DNA, with a small sequence, okay? And this could be A, T, G, C, whatever this could be. And now suppose you have this piece of double standard DNA with a single standard overhang. And if you put it in a test tube, which has thousands of other sequences, this will go and recognize or bind with only the sequence, which is exactly complementary to it uh, by the Watson and Crick base pair. So we use Watson Crick base pair as a molecular glue to stick or bring together the pieces of the DNA. And this is the hallmark of the DNA nanotechnology. So how do we do it? So let's say I take, I'll show you with a simple example. Like we can buy four primers or four short pieces of the DNA. Or if you have a DNA synthesizer in the laboratory, we can even do the synthesis of the DNA. Assume I have taken four pieces of the DNA. I mix it in a test tube with some buffer. And this green, is complementary to this red part, this green is complementary to this blue part, this to yellow and yellow to blue. And what I have done is I have designed the single standard sequences in such a way that this single standard piece of DNA is complementary to this A prime and B is complementary to B prime. Now, when we mix these four strands of DNA in a test tube, uh, we put it in a PCR machine, we heat it nicely so that everything is denatured and then we slowly cool it from 95 degrees to four degrees. And during this cooling process, they will start to self-assemble. And what will happen is that the process will not stop at this motif, but they will start to self-assemble further into two dimensional sheets, which you can now see or visualize 
by the microscopes like the atomic force microscope or the electron microscope. And this is the principle of the DNA nanotechnology. It's much, much simple because you can easily modulate or synthesize different DNA strands. It's much, much robust. If you can make these devices into quantitative aids into the, uh, um, in the real world, in the test tubes, and it is designable. Like you can easily change the designs or whatever you want, like whichever shape you want uh, to make, not only in 1D or 2D, but in 3D. So I'll show you one simple example. Like this is uh, the three-dimensional polyhedra, which were made by the laboratory of Park Bate uh, at MIT. And now many, many groups all over the world are making such very beautiful three-dimensional structures. Now, when I show you these structures or whenever I show this to the students, the first question which we ask is that, can we do something with these kind of devices? Like these three-dimensional devices, which are made up of the DNA, they have two very crucial properties that they have an inner cavity so that you can put something inside it. It could be a drug, it could be antibody, anything which you want to deliver at a site inside the animal. And they have a very well-defined three-dimensional surface, which you can easily explore to couple anything which you want. Like if you want to put a targeting entity, a small molecule, a peptide, protein, whatever you want, you can couple it on the surface of the DNA and then you put it in the, uh, inject it in the animal and this could be targeted at the site of the drug release, right? So this was one of the key features of the DNA uh, nano devices. And one subfield of the DNA nanotechnology, which has been hugely explored these days, is the DNA origami. Like I'm sure we all must have seen our grandmothers with two needles and a piece of a thread. And those grandmothers used to play around with the two needles and the thread and they could make a sweater or a cloth out of it. And they could fold the thread into a design, a sweater or anything, a piece of cloth. Same is the art of DNA origami, where you can now take a single sided long piece of DNA. This could be viral, viral uh, DNA or it could be a bacterial DNA. And then you can take this long piece of DNA and fold it into a shape of your choice using other small pieces of the DNA. So what we are looking here is the black, which is a single standard viral scaffold of the DNA. And then if I mix in the test tube, small staple strands like this yellow and the blue, they start to bring different components or different parts of this viral genome viral DNA into confinement and this results into the formation of a well-defined 2D and now the 3D structures. So this field is called as uh, DNA origami and there's a small video which I thought I can share for a better understanding. So I, I hope you all can see the video. So this is a long viral DNA. The black strand is a DNA and these are small staple strands which are floating in a test tube and we are doing this in a PCR machine that we heat everything and then we slowly cool it. And as we cool it, this DNA starts to form the Watson and Crick base pairing. But at the same time, these small pieces are bringing another sections of the large DNA into a confinement. And at the end, you can get a well-defined tile, a 2D tile, or you can make different like smiley structures, star shape structures, not only in 2D, but in 3D as well at a very, very quantitative ease. And this, has led to, uh, to make us a full galaxy of the devices. And I think in this part, I have been able to show you that we can encode the structure in the DNA sequences. Like if I change the sequences, I can actually fold it into a target object, right? And this, has, this is precisely what we have been using to the DNA devices to make any variety of the devices which you want. Now that was all the structural part of the DNA. Now comes a big question that what do we do with such DNA devices? Like they're really good looking at the AFM or the electron microscope, but can they function in the biological systems? And the answer is yes, like that's how precisely the field of the DNA nanotechnology started. That when Ned Seaman uh, in New York University wanted to make those DNA lattices, his aim was to make the scaffolds for the protein crystallization and if you could put the proteins into those cavities and see if you can crystallize this. So the very basis of the structural DNA nanotechnology is the applications. And for today's talk, I have like kind of limited the applications. There are many, many applications in the computing, structural biology, 
uh, energy harvesting but uh, since we are now talking about today uh, the the covid 19 applications i thought i will limit some of my applications and we can um, briefly uh, summarize the the bio applications of dna nano devices into bio sensing bio imaging and the therapeutics and like first i'll uh, discuss two simple examples first is the example from the lab of professor yamuna krishnan uh, at u chicago where she demonstrated that if you take two pieces of the dna and join them with a fluorophore so this 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 is a, a donor fluorophore and this is an acceptor fluorophore and what she did is she could modify the single stranded dna into i motif forming sequences so these i motif forming sequences form the cytosine cytosine bonds only at the acidic ph right so at the ph 7 this sensor is kind of open you don't see any fret and when you put a small drop of acid the ph changes this i motif forms here and you can see a very good fret signal and using this fret as a readout she could her lab could develop not only the ph sensors but now they have made a variety of sensors to map small molecules free radicals etc enzyme activities in the cells and in the animals and this was the very very first demonstrations from her lab that if you inject this i motif or a nano machine inside the c ligands the living organism not only is it targeted to particular sites but it can measure the ph in those cellular compartments wherever it is targeted and now they have made a full variety of sensors for the chloride ion uh, nos reactive oxygen species enzyme activities and etc and etc but today uh, since we are talking about covid 19 uh, naturally uh, these sensors were existing and people started to ask can it now be used can these dna nano devices be used to make sensors for coronavirus detection so remember at this moment the covid 19 di diagnosis which is happening is mostly based on the rt pcr uh, technique where we isolate the viral rna we convert it into the dna and then we amplify the dna to see whether the viral rna is present in the sample or not and that is like a time consuming and a bit expensive uh, method so people are ready to ask that can we make a simple method or simple colorimetric detection kit by which we can say whether the viral rna is present in the uh, in the liquid or the blood sample or not and these are the very very first reports which have started to come out where people have used gold nanoparticles which are functionalized with the single stranded dna now remember one thing that the gold nanoparticles have one particular color so they have a very very uh, specific uh, absorbance and they uh, emit one particular color and the single stranded dna if you functionalize it on the viral dna structures they will repel each other so the single stranded dna will repel each other and you will get one particular color let's say blue and if you add the rna from the virus the corona virus this rna will go and bind to this double strand to this dna and that will make bring more and more nanoparticles uh, into close confinement and this process is called as aggregation and the moment you get the aggregation the color of the solution changes and by using this colorimetric technique people are now making very very simple devices by which you can tell that in this soup is the corona virus present or not so but still the 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 challenge remains with, before the community is that this method needs rna like if you put a virus intact virus or a saliva sample or a blood sample it will not work so you need to break the virus remove the rna and then expose it to these devices and they will tell you based on the colorimetric detection that is the viral rna present or not so these are like technologies which are in progress but i think very soon we will see very sensitive single molecule efficient uh, devices in markets based on these simple processes of the aggregation and deaggregation to detect the viral rna right so this could be like implemented in the schools or in the simple laboratories which have a simple spectrometer or a 96 well plate readout where you can do the multiplex imaging or diagnosis of the blood samples using this technology so this was uh, the the some of the examples about the biosensors the second part was of the applications which i thought to uh, briefly touch base was this bio imaging applications that i i told you that those dna cages or the 3d devices which we can make you can put something inside those cavities so you can like for example put a nanoparticles inside those cages 
and see by the electron microscope indeed the encapsulation of those devices in this um, inside those uh, cells and you can also use them for the delivery applications so one of the uh, experiment which we did long back was that you can take a simple model drug dextran a dextran molecule and label it with a fluorophore you can put it FITC, the FITS molecule, which is fluorophore. And if you inject the free drug in the animal, so this is a model animal like called the C. elegans, the free drug in the cavity of the animal, you see that it goes and diffuses all over the animal uh, cell, uh, animal um, body without any specific uptake. Now, if you take the same concentration of the drug and encapsulate it inside the DNA cage, and then injected in the animal what you see is that there is minimum diffusion in the body of the animal but very very specific uptake into the target cells so these are the cells which express the receptors for the negatively charged molecules like the dna and then the dna is getting targeted and remember that we can program the surface of the dna so for example if i now take the surface of the dna and instead of unmodified dna i put some targeting protein then these cages will be targeted to the sites where the receptors for this protein are expressed. So we established in the last couple of years the methodologies to encapsulate drug molecules inside the DNA cages, functionalize the surface of those protein uh, DNA with different ligands so that you can target them to specific locations in the cells or in the animals and then come up with the strategies by which you can open the cages and release the drug at a targeted site. So this is one different branch of the DNA uh, nanotechnology, which is uh, uh, having applications in the bioimaging um, 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 domain. And which brings me to the last part, which is kind of the therapeutics, that if we, can, if we can image it, can we deliver some functional molecules? And can we use it for the therapeutic applications? So some of the work which was done uh, in last couple of years, mostly by the lab of Bob Langer and Anderson at uh, uh, Koch Institute and MIT, where they were able to take those DNA cages and functionalize it with different drugs. So you can take, you can treat SI RNA, a small interfering RNA itself as a drug, which can inhibit the activity of a protein inside the cells. And they could functionalize these DNA cages with a molecule called as folic acid, which can target the folate receptor into those cancer cells. And then they were able to show that not only are these devices able to target the cancer tissues in the animal, but then they also release this siRNA at those sites, and then which leads to the decrease of the tumor size inside those animals. So these were the therapeutic applications about of those DNA devices. And one last example, which has been recently uh, come up um, by the lab of Professor Hendrik Dietz, uh, in Germany, which directly uses this DNA cages to encapsulate or trap the viruses, the coronaviruses. And the aim is that if we can trap it, can we like kind of degrade the virus in a nano container environment? Because at this moment, the world is eagerly waiting for the vaccine. And most of the time, the vaccine will be either a small molecule, a drug, or the protein, which is the antibody against the virus, right? Both of which are taking time and optimization. But somehow, can we come up with some technology development by which we could scavenge the fraction of the viruses from the blood or from the systems so that you, the, the titer of the virus goes down in the living system. So this was one of the main aim to develop DNA-based devices to target the coronavirus. So uh, this brings me back to our DNA cages. So these are the origami-based uh, DNA devices or the cages. And remember, you can make different sizes of the cages. You can make a small cage, a medium-sized cage, and a large-sized cage. And the aim of this study was to come up with a cage which can trap the entire virus, entire coronavirus. So at this moment, all the experiments are done with the hepatitis B virus, which is the size of 35 nanometers. Because coronavirus is a pretty big one. It has the size of 100 to 120 nanometers. So still, the technology is under development to come up with bigger cages to trap a particle of 100 nanometers. But nonetheless, so let's say this is a model system and this is a coronavirus. And what we can do is if we can make a DNA cage or a DNA shell with degradative properties so that it can not only engulf the coronavirus, but it can degrade it inside uh, its cavity. Right? So this was the main aim 
of the, the, the study, which is done by Henrik Dix. It's still under work uh, in progress, but we have uh, permissions from him to present uh, this data uh, in front of you. And he could make different DNA cages. So these are the cryo electron microscope based reconstruction uh, images of the cages of different geometries and different sizes. And here you can see very nice formation of those cages. And you can also see the virus which can be trapped inside the cage. So he also used a similar strategy. Like instead of making a full cage, we can make two half cages with some glue or some attractant inside those cavity so that the virus could be trapped inside its cavity. So for example, like this, that if you have a shell, can you fit a virus inside this? And then you will have some degradative enzymes at this site so that they can degrade the virus. And this is exactly how the systems looks like. So they have taken this DNA. So this is all this origami based structures and they have functionalized the inner core or the inner layer of the origami with the antibodies, which can capture the virus. For example, if you put the ACE2 antibody, it can attract very well the coronavirus from the blood samples and this will go and stick at those sites. And they could show by the electron microscope that these DNA origami cages can indeed encapsulate or engulf the viruses from the solution. So these are some of the free viruses which have not been entrapped, but they are making more and more uh, uh, attractive cages so that a big fraction of the viruses from the solution gets trapped into those DNA cages. And does it really work? Like does it, can you degrade it and inhibit the interaction of the viruses with the cell surface? So they did very, very simple experiment like to prove their technique uh, if it works. So you can take a cell mimic surface or you can take a glass cover slip and coat it with a fibronectin or some molecules which disassemble the cell surface of the antibodies against the coronavirus. And then you can put a secondary antibody which can give rise to the fluorescent signal, the H2O2 and the, the, the fluoropore, which will tell you the virus is active, right? And what they found was that if you do it in absence of the DNA cage, there is no viral blocking, which means the activity is 100%. But then if you do this experiment in the presence of the DNA cages, you see that the activity blocking or the virus blocking on the glass cover slip can be blocked in a very, very quantitative manner, like up to 90 to 100% virus blocking can be affected uh, on those glass cover slips in presence of the DNA cages, which really give a promise that if we can now scale it up, those DNA cages and somehow put them in this blood samples or blood uh, streams, they can kind of hijack the viruses from the solution and then those viruses could be degraded. So, but it's still a work in progress, but still looks like it is kind of promising technology to come up in the coming times. So this was uh, like the modification that how to degrade the virus and come up with different, um, like optimize the protocols to uh, entrap the coronavirus. Because as I said, that the experiments are done with the herpes virus, which is a small one, but the corona is big one. So we are still working, the community is working uh, to come up with, uh, with the solutions for that. And with this, uh, it brings me to the last uh, slide of my presentation that the DNA nanotechnology field uh, began with this part, like when it started in 1980s and the 90s, it all came up with the design rules, like the, how to make different geometry designs, assembly rules, sequence design, stability of those cages. And then a big fraction of the community has been working from last five, 10 years on the functionalization of those devices with nanomaterials, proteins, dyes, and et cetera, and et cetera. And now what we see is the next layer, which is going of the DNA nanotechnology is towards the translational and the clinical applications where we are now working on in vivo targeting, deep tissue bioimaging, sensing and delivery, and interference with the biomaterials. As I said, there are not many applications of those, this technology in energy harvesting, metal ion synthesis, and uh, others, but due to the scope of this talk, I limited it only to the applications related to the corona uh, uh, pandemic. So with this, I will stop. I would like to thank you all for your time. And I hope I was able to give you a small glimpse into this new uh, technology, uh, which is rapidly emerging. And we need like scientists from nanotechnology, virus, virology, biologists to come together and work uh, to come up with a, like, a, um, like a robust results 
or tools against the, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. So with, I will stop here and thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dheeraj. It was Thanks. very uh, wonderful and uh, very informative talk. And Thank especially you. like uh, how Corona assembles and uh, how we can use DNA origami. Yeah. And uh, the most interesting part is like uh, how we can create these uh, nano devices, especially the DNA based uh, uh, nano devices, and that can be used for the biosensors, bioimaging, and uh, therapeutics. And right. It's just like fishing out a uh, virus out of your Absolutely. body. And Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, really fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank yeah. So, floor is open. And uh, so, people, if you have any questions, just please uh, start. Uh, Priyanka, would you like to go for the question and answer session? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dheeraj. That was really a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Priyanka. Yeah. Uh, it thank was you. really nice. So, uh, I have a lot many questions, but I'll restrict myself now for now. <laughs> okay, but I'll ask questions people who have posted. So, firstly, as you talked about the gold nanoparticle uh, diagnostic tool, where we have you have the gold nanoparticle, the single DNA on the top of it. So there is Yogita who is asking: Is there any size or shape dependence of gold nanoparticle on the calorimetric titration? Yes, there is definitely. So uh, uh, what we know is that the gold nanoparticle aggregation is very very uh, geometry dependent, dependent, not size as much. Uh, fortunately, what happened is the spherical nanoparticles, which are the most simple ones, they respond best. So people didn't go much on the engineering, the, the dimensions or the geometries of the gold nanoparticles. Of course, a lot has been done before uh, on that, uh, but spherical nanoparticles, they're much, much easier to functionalize with the DNA. A, they can be easily made. B, and C, they respond very nicely to the, co the, the external RNA. So the, the job was already much easier. Okay. Thank you for the uh, clarification. Uh, so moving on, as you said about the last strategy, where they have tried capturing using the DNA origami, the yes. Henrik Dix. That was really a wonderful approach. So there's uh, Subindu Seel who is asking that, what is the immunogenicity of these DNA cages? So when you actually Absolutely. go to the yeah. clinical. Yeah. yeah, very, very important question. And I think uh, as a field, we are in a very, uh, like we don't understand fully how, what is the immune response of those DNA cages or DNA origami in the uh, living organisms. The results are like at this moment, we have two or three publications where people have tried to address this aspect, especially Bob Langer's lab and all. So they inject the, C the, the DNA cages in the mouse. And the only output which has been studied is this interferon secretion or inter, uh, yeah. Uh, and what they observed was that the DNA cages are kind of non-immunogenic. Same was the observation done by some other groups that unless and until you put very, very specific sequences like those CPG motifs or islands in the DNA cages, most of them are not immunogenic. But we need much more investigation on that. Like there are hardly any papers in this aspect. Uh, okay, so a, a continuation of this is also like a, what is which also I also had uh, the question. So what is the uh, pharmacokinetics and the dynamics of this DNA cages? Not studied. Like uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, not many people have studied this. So now very few results have started to come from the Chinese groups, but they're all in the infancy. So we still need to do a detailed thorough study of how uh, this DNA cages interact with the biological systems, especially the animal models. Okay. So, uh, 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 I think there are uh, very few questions, but I'll just ask my questions. Sure. So uh, he, uh, I have a doubt. So as you said, there are we you have making DNA origami, or many people are working on DNA origami, and they have been working uh, in top passing drugs and all. So what is the stability of this DNA origami, like yeah, yeah, in compared yeah. to other normal drugs? Yes, yes. Yeah. So the biggest advantage of this closed origami is that they, uh, like if you see the, the way DNA gets degraded is only by the exonucleases or the nuclease enzymes. Fortunately, the eukaryotes do not have the restriction endonuclease. So only way the DNA can be degraded is by the exonuclease thing. And what we have also shown and some other people have shown, that if you uh, properly close all those uh, open ends of the DNA, these cages are exceptionally stable. Like what we did was that when you make a DNA cage, so we use two half cups. So we put a donor chlorophore on one side and acceptor on the other side. We made the cage and you start monitoring FRET. 
and the moment the thread breaks that will tell you that the cage has been broken and we were able to show even in the c elegans that uh, the cage is stable for up to 24 hours in the living animal and also in the test tube on the gels everything that like really very stable okay uh, so uh, in case of uh, as you said that the this dna nanoparticles as you said it's a complementary base pairing watson free mm -hmm. Yes, but we are also aware of the non-Watson Crick base. Absolutely, pair. yes, yeah. So, so yes. can you like how the design and the property changes if you actually use non-Watson Crick base? Pair? Yeah, yeah, people, we have done that. Like not not just our labs, uh, uh, in collaboration with Professor Yamuna Krishnan's lab and other groups, they're doing it now. So, as okay. I said, that these DNA cages are extremely stable, but you don't want it to be stable in the living organisms. Like you want it to go and open up at one particular point. So now, let's say. If I, at those sites where the DNA molecules are arranging, if I put some non watson crick base pairings, for example, I motif forming sequences or G quadruplex forming sequences, I'm actually giving a stimulus that now they can fold and unfold based on the pH changes or the ion changes in the systems. So we are actually programming them to open up. Okay, so basically you're using non watson crick yeah, yeah, people are doing different, that, yeah. To detect different stresses in the uh, surroundings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. People have done that. Like many now, those three D cages based on the I motif have come out. Uh, there are some reports on the G quadruplex as well in uh, formation. The A motif based. Yeah, there are a couple of reports coming up now. Okay, so there are a few questions uh, uh, again. So, uh, so one question is: Can we use DNA nano cages to trap bacteriophages? Oh. In principle, yes, but it all actually depends on the size of the particle which you want to trap. At this moment, to the best of our knowledge, the DNA origami, we are limited with the scaffold, like the scaffolds which are available in the market to make the DNA cages. These are mostly the viral scaffolds. And now people have started to use the bacterial scaffolds. And even under those conditions, you can make a device of 100 to 200 nanometers at the max. So now if the virus is like a cylindrical virus or a, a virus of 120 nanometer, 150 nanometers, you need a device which is much bigger to engulf it. Now, uh, at this moment, scaling up a DNA nanotechnology is a bit, uh, like I would say in the infant times, so we have look, some groups and some startup companies are now working on can we make larger sizes of the cages and the larger scaffolds to make, let's say, a sub-micron level device. So those efforts are still ongoing. Okay, so... Uh... Uh, another person, Divya, she she is asking whether they have been used in plants. Such nanotechnology are there reports in studying yes. stress response in plants? I, I, to the best of my knowledge, no, but I could be wrong. Like I, I think very recently there was one paper from Chinese group where they explored DNA cages in plants, but not to the best. Like there are hardly one or two papers. Now, not much has been investigated in this this domain. Yes, so um, there is uh, Arun Kumar uh, and he is asking like, uh, as you said that uh, 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 in the last slides that they are using to capture viruses. So I think what I understand from his question is, can he use this in farming or actually inactivating viruses using his DNA cages and can then can be used in producing yeah, vaccines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we can, we can, yes. Only thing is it needs much more engineering. Like what uh, the designs which uh, uh, Hendrik did shows is that you have to make the DNA cages, put antibodies on uh, on the inner side and then put it. Now what happens is, uh, that's a good proof of concept. But when it comes to the real world uh, thing, uh, now what my, we are trying to do is antibodies are also sensitive and expensive. So we are trying to make aptamers, like which are again DNA mimics of the antibodies. And now you have something called as biofunctional aptamers, that they will not only bind to the target, but they will also inactivate the activity of the target. And that would be one of the best solutions. So we are working on those. Uh, at this moment, we don't have the results to share. So since the, because of the lockdown, everything was closed, but hopefully very soon we'll be able to show uh, some results in that domain. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I have again a few questions. <laughs> so uh, as I see, these are very big, big structures. So how is the solubility of the structures? like? It's a DNA. It's a negatively charged molecule. The best so dissolving like, molecule in the water right. or the biological buffers. So it doesn't hamper how structure is going big or it doesn't no, affect the structure. As long, as long as you maintain the iron concentration, like the phosphate buffer, a simple phosphate buffer, importantly, it needs magnesium. 
because what's happening is you are bringing a lot of dns strands together in the vicinity so by simple imagination there will be a lot of repulsion like the negative charges should repel each other uh, but then you have to increase the magnesium ion concentration so what magnesium does is it forms a small positively charged pockets and then the dns strands can be uh, attached together or they can be bought together in a small volume okay uh, so but when we add any drug to it so does the solubility decrease depend on the property of the drug yes property yes yes that that's true like um, if suppose there are some drugs which are like only organic um, solvents uh, soluble then there is a problem to it uh, at this moment what we have explored is mostly water soluble drugs like we have even tried to put some crystals uh, which are at this moment they are water soluble so we have not tested any organic solvents but you you are right like if there is a drug which does not like the organic phase uh, so the, the aqueous phase there could be a problem solubility issues okay so uh, another also uh, arun kumar he is asking like uh, what is the uh, how the oligomer structures interact with the biological barriers like the gastrointestinal tract or the intestinal barrier that you have so can they be used as a yeah 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 so not much has been explored the first thing which happened like if you inject this dna kgs or origami in the animal uh, the first site where they go is the kidneys and what we know is a big fraction of it actually gets cleared through the kidneys so uh, the only way to bypass it is functionalize the dna cage with something like for example if you put a folic acid on it it will go to the cancer cells expressing high amount of folate receptor and that's the way you enrich it same thing is like if you want to target it to the neurons you have to put some neuropeptides or some antibody which can take it to the synapses or the neurons and that way you kind of bypass the kidney Uh, filtration but that issue still remains that 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 issue uh, like there are some groups in us who are working on how to bypass that or how to suppress it but i don't think there is a very good success in that till now okay i think we will uh, finish our question answer session sure. here because we sure. first 10 minutes thank you so much i think thank i'll you. tell uh, ej to take over so he can sure. conclude the session okay thank you priyanka thank, thank you, you dheeraj for thanks a lot uh, all questions and answers yeah, so yeah it was, uh, just say one thing like i tried to answer as much as i could but if there is some absolutely. doubt meaning if i could not clarify maybe people can just drop a email to me and i'll be happy to uh, yeah, yeah. help i think that we, what we will do we can actually put up your email here so that anybody who has any questions regarding your presentation sure, can sure. that would be yeah email. i'll be happy to discuss or help further uh, yeah Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We will, we will send a email to all of our subscribers, and if they have any question, they can directly email you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, everyone. I would like okay. to conclude this session for the day, and uh, I'm really happy that you have spared like your time and um, joined us today. It was very informative and very uh, uh, so many new things that we came to know. so i would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to join and visit our website that is coronacures.co and uh, the cypreneur.com where we are actually bridging science and entrepreneurship and uh, check all possible resources and informations and make full use of it and if you have any question you can send us directly at uh, teamcoronacures@gmail.com and uh, also i would like to tell you one more thing that on next next 20, next uh, 21st of june we are going to organize another session of webinar where we are we have invited dr anil kumar from washington state university and um, uh, that would be really wonderful talk and i'm sure you are going to enjoy it. and uh, this and i think he has joined us for the session yeah he has joined us for the session dr anil thank you thank you dr singh for joining yeah. us and uh, and this recording of uh, today's talk would be available on our youtube channel and we will circulate through email as well and uh, and thanks again for your time and joining us see you on 21st and by the time stay safe stay healthy thank okay. you thanks thanks